What would it be like to drive Thomas the Tank Engine? Many children dream of becoming a train driver one day, but if Thomas and his thousands of acquaintances were alive, would it really be as fun as it sounds? Today you get to see how I've wasted my time these last few days to find out what a typical day could look like as a driver on Sodor. This was spurred on partly by Tomscar's Thomas Analysis, and also Unlucky Tug's Unanswerable Thomas Questions from way back when. So go and check those out after watching this TED Talk. Before we steam ahead into the video, I just want to let you know that the island of Sodor is real. The engines are real, and you can see them yourself this summer. On the 23rd and 24th of July 2022, the Talislin Railway in Wales is hosting the Audrey Extravaganza 2, and the whole line will be transformed into the Scarlowy Railway. Back from last year, again you get to see Reverend Audrey's own models up close, alongside the original paintings and behind-the-scenes artefacts from both the Railway series and the television show. TV presenter Tim Dunn will again perform one of the great author's lectures on the railways of Sodor. You'll also find him at The Toby, a pop-up pub where Tim will read various stories from the Railway series throughout the weekend. New for this year, out on the line you can have a chance at driving Duncan for yourself, so you can make the whole topic of this video redundant. Yay. Peter Sam will proudly be hauling The Picnic, a Midsodor experience, an afternoon tea train which fans will definitely want a slice of. There's also a Scarlowy photo charter, taking you to very iconic locations from the books so you can recreate the illustrations for yourself. Tickets for this extravagant event will go on sale at 4pm on the 19th of March, and there are limited spaces on the special trains and at the exhibition, so don't wait around. No hurry, no hurry, Puff Duke. You're wrong, Duke. You're wrong. Unlike other vehicle shows where the cast are fully self-controlled from the starting line, the Reverend Audrey's fictional work is in fact set in the real world. The trains are real, and they work to transport people and goods in the same way that real trains do. There isn't any magic or hallucinations involved, but the only difference in this world compared to ours is that some of the vehicles have faces. People aren't really shocked at this, it's just how it is. It's like how parrots can talk, and monkeys can replicate human movement. Although, yes, it must have been strange when the first engine was built and it started blinking. It's all in me head, it's all in me head. You wake up at 5am and get ready for work. It's too early to say goodbye to the family, but you're probably aware that you may never see them again, because the risks that you're going to be going through today are unnerving to say the least. You cycle through the sleepy village of Farquhar, and clock on at the loco shed. Make a cup of tea and start preparing your engine. The firemen and cleaners are already there and you quietly start going round oiling the motion, trying not to wake the engines. Some of the things they say in their sleep are disturbing to say the least, whilst you're using an oil can in rather uncomfortable positions, but it's worse for the fireman who has to open the door that the face is on to clean out the ash from the smoke box. For anyone whose first day it is at the railway, seeing this down the shed is enough to haunt you for life. They feed them a barrow full of firewood as it's a healthy breakfast for steam engines, high in protein, before adding a round of coal. After a few hours, steam has been raised and Thomas slowly wakes up. Throughout the good morning formalities, he begins bossing the cleaner about because they didn't polish his brass whistle enough, and everyone is vain on this island but you're soon ready to start your day. After the usual prep, open the regulator and out you go into the yard to get coal and water. Thomas is still waking up, so when you get to the carriage sheds, his temper is short when Annie and Clarabelle complain that they'll be late. It's even worse when Percy overhears the little caterpillar and he mutters how Thomas has it easy just pulling passenger trains. And the whole town is awoken as they start arguing. On the journey, you get stopped by the usual hindrances. A cow on the line, Mrs Kindly wanted to stop for a chat, and despite the fireman's best efforts, Thomas just doesn't want to steam today. It's only made worse when you see Bertie the bus, because everyone is competitive on this island, and he jokes that Thomas is getting old. 
Considering he's well over a hundred, he's not doing too badly to be fair. At the big station, the Fat Controller praises Thomas for being really useful, whilst you, the driver, don't get a word in or even a pay rise. You're by the seaside, so it must be something in the air, because you're definitely not salty about it. No, why would you be? You're expected to be extremely fit to work on the Northwestern Railway, as proven by the guard who you see running up the line to warn you that Percy has broken down and you need to go and rescue the train. You leave the passengers, who immediately start shouting and throwing bricks, and head off up the line. Thomas is in a great mood when he sees Percy stranded in a siding, because he's been practicing his comeback speech for the past few miles. Again, the poor cleaner has to get uncomfortably close to the giant screaming face of the truck to uncouple the train, but you're then ready to take them to the harbour. Oh no, but then there was trouble, because Percy wound up the trucks and they want to get their own back on whichever engine is closest. You realise what those documents were that you were asked to sign before you were hired, as they start forcing the train downhill. You apply the brakes, but they're useless as the train hurtles down the line. Nearing a bend, you have no choice but to jump clear, leaping out of the cab at about 50 miles an hour as the train derails and several trucks are destroyed in a pile-up, laughing with joy as wood splinters everywhere. Luckily, no one was hurt. The fourth crash you've had in the past year, but yet again everyone somehow managed to get away unscathed, and you dare not question why. Thomas is sobbing as he's put back on the rails, and giving the usual monologue on why he shouldn't have been so cheeky. The Fat Controller's there, and he scolds him, but you get a right telling off as well, because you're the one that lost control of the train, and your salary gets cut. Not only that, but to teach him how to handle trucks properly, you're all to be stuck shunting in the yard until you can be trusted again. Could be worse, at least the boiler didn't explode. That night at the sheds, the fireman gets the unfortunate job of climbing into the pit and emptying Thomas's ash pan. It's unpleasant to talk about what this would be if it was a human analogy. They rake out the fire bars from Clinker, which is pretty much the equivalent of cleaning Thomas's teeth, and you put the engines to bed. Your family ask how your day was at work. They're amazed that you get to work with the actual world-famous Thomas the Tank Engine but you just smile and try to recover for the day ahead. But that night your dreams are haunted by the worries that the shed might blow up from a rather explosive boulder. You'll fall into the sea, get lost at sea, nearly tumble off a bridge, fall down a mine, get stuck underground, or be put in A&E because of some projectile fruit. I'm no engine driver myself, but I've been lucky enough to volunteer on the footplate of a few engines, big and small, including some of the ones that the characters are actually based on. I'm still very much learning, but I'm pretty sure that if there was the added element of them being alive, it would make things a whole lot more difficult. If the driver wants to go, but the engine wants to put the brakes on, who wins? As in reality, trains cannot operate without their crew but they do get some degree of self-contained movement, and their selfish emotions often mean that they end up in a mess. Thankfully, they generally do have good intentions, and seem to get genuine gratification from being useful, so most of the time they don't mind doing their intended jobs. Like we all learn in life, not every job is as fun as you'd like, but it still has to be done. This is where the line is drawn between seeing the engines as slaves to the oppressing fat controller, and having their own freedom. It's like having a horse running in the wild, and not having to pull carts or gallop in wars for humans. Only, the catch is the horse isn't actually able to do anything on its own, and just has to stand there. Huh. <laughs> Railway engines are literally nicknamed Iron Horses, and in that sense the engines of Sodor are more pets to their owners, rather than slaves to their masters. Does that make sense? It still sounds wrong. There's still a lot of ethical red flags about this, but the bottom line is the engines were not intended to be slaves personified as trains. They're just actual trains who happen to have faces. 
The whole lore of the island of Sodor was made from a children's bedtime story in the 1940s. So not everything makes sense and not everything has aged well. But Audrey wasn't some Charles Dickens villain ordering people about in a Victorian textiles mill. He was just a reverend and a part-time author. You have to remember the reason why he personified the trains at all. They felt real. I, I have a feeling there's, uh, you could liken perhaps some steam engines to, to people, really. Uh, I think this has been said before, and this is nothing original from me by any means, but I have a feeling that, well, you know, steam engines breathe, they eat, and they uh, excrete as well. So uh, perhaps that's the fascination. Certainly they're all very individual. You'll hear it from anyone who's worked on a steam engine. They are such temperamental, unpredictable and demanding machines that they feel almost like they're living. There are thousands of ways in which you can compare the ways a steam engine works to human biology. And even two identical machines can act differently. Unlike cars or diesel and electric locos, a driver and fireman must really work with a steam engine to get where they're going, and it's all the more rewarding when they get there. That said, there will be times when, for seemingly no mechanical reason whatsoever, they'll just refuse to work. Even without a giant grey face, they can get tired and run out of steam, where you'll just have to sit and wait until they're ready. And they can kick up a fuss if you feed them a different kind of coal. They can get short of breath if the fire doesn't have enough air, and they need to be cleaned to avoid damage. It's very elemental-based technology, and if treated right, they can last hundreds of years. But it's a full-on, hands-on job. If I worked on the railways of Sodor, I'd definitely want to work on one of the quieter branches, just in case. But to me, it's pretty clear that in the books, the teamwork between the engine and the person is always there. The crew get annoyed if the engine goes against their advice, and the engine gets annoyed if they can't stop to go fishing or do prestigious jobs. Still, it's a great life on the footplate of an engine, and it's great to be an engine, so we've been told. So, I'm sure living on Sodor isn't as sarcastic and sinister as I've painted it out to be. What do you think? Which character would you stay clear of working with? And what sort of day would be your ideal? Thank you to all of my brilliant patrons, Alex Goodman, GBH Train, Donald Nine and Douglas Ten, D0280 Falcon, Sean Tempest, Kildane's Coven, Nat, Sam Bennett, Alco, and Henry Forrester.